My name is Ed Sibley and I am the lead narrative designer at a studio called Fusebox Games. Um, we are best known for our work adapting uh, TV formats like Love and Island and The X Factor into free-to-play, choice-based narrative mobile games. Uh, basically kind of visual novels in the kind of style of games like Choices or Episodes. Um, has anyone played any of our games? Hey, oh, okay, great. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. So uh, we released uh, Love Island, the game, last summer uh, in like June of 2018. And then we spent several weeks sitting at the top of like top grossing charts on iOS and Android. And uh, we got to be a finalist in, uh, in the best storytelling category of the Mobile Game Awards that are happening this evening. So that's my kind of credentials here. Um, and I'm going to be talking basically about um, how we handled the task of turning a... Uh, like a popular IP into a kind of into a mobile game. It's been a hell of a trip. Um, but yes, the talk's gonna be like a whistle stop tour around some observations based on my experience working with IP, some things I think we did right, uh, some things that I'd do differently next time. Uh, I'm a narrative designer, um, so some of what I'm gonna say is gonna focus on the implications of licensed IPs for narrative games, but much of this is probably gonna be generally applicable to people who are interested in sort of game design and project management around this kind of area of licensed IPs. Um, again, it's only quite a short slot and I've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to get into it. Um, from a kind of like a business point of view, oh, I'm sorry about my slides, by the way. I'm like a writer at heart. I don't know how to make them like look real nice. But um, <laughs> So uh, from a business point of view, the benefit of working with an IP is kind of fairly self-explanatory, I think, and I won't dwell on it too long. You've got like a ready-made audience of fans, you get low CPIs, you've got high organic traffic. There's potential for cross-promotion with, you know, the native medium of the IP. Um, the important consideration is that your audience aren't necessarily people familiar with games. They're people who might be arriving at your thing having seen a TV program, but might never have played a mobile game, you know, of any sort in their lives. And that leads to all kinds of, like, interesting design questions. Um, I also think it's worth stating that from a creative point of view, the, um, the benefit of working with a big IP is that it has an audience. But if it has an audience, you can also trust that it's basically doing something right. Um, Successful IP formats, whether they're reality TV shows or internet comics or sporting franchises, they work because they reliably produce entertainment. And I feel like this is something that often gets lost in these kinds of conversations, potentially because there's this, uh, this cliche of the cynical IP tie-in that looms kind of large or, um, I don't know, because people aren't used to seeing good quality IP adaptations, potentially. But I think it's worth stating kind of as an axiom that big IPs are big, because lots of people like them. Um, and, uh, and if people like them, there must be something real in there that people like. Um, so try and keep that in the back of your head during the rest of this talk. I think it kind of informs a lot of the kind of philosophy behind the methods I'm going to talk about. So um, here's an... A. Um, here's an anecdote. So a few weeks after the game came out, I bumped into John Ingold, who's the guy behind Inkle Studios, and he said something to me that I'm not ever going to forget. He said, well, you've certainly done something right. And then he paused for a moment, and then he said, uh, or at least you haven't done something wrong. So those obviously will be the words on my gravestone. But um, he was right. I think the reason that the game enjoyed the success it did is at its heart, because we didn't get the IP wrong. Um, the important thing, I think, is that if you're making a game for an IP audience, they're going to come to your product with a lot of expectations. Um, it's absolutely critical that you avoid upsetting those expectations. So understanding the brand and building your game around like a frank analysis of it is critical. Um, the problem is, the minute you say the phrase, Love Island, the game, uh, people already have an idea of what that is, right? You, you kind of, you've already got ideas about what should be happening in that game, what's going to be kind of on my screen from one moment to the next. Um, and you've got a problem if once the game arrives in someone's hands, um, it fails to meet those expectations. So I think the most important step when adapting a popular IP is to make sure that your team understand why the people who care about that IP actually like it. Uh, in our case, it helped, I think, that I'm actually like a sincere fan of Love Island. I really enjoy it as a TV program. I think it's very funny. Um, but I think that if your staff aren't taking a basically sincere pleasure in the IP that you're adapting, you're going to have a much harder time making your adaptation a success. Uh, because, you know, your creative team's um, assumptions about the IP aren't necessarily going to map onto the assumptions that the audience have about it or about why it's, uh, why it's something worth being engaged with. And this has, like, practical implications. Um, so for that reason, providing a very clear articulation of the appeal of the IP should be the starting point for your entire creative process. Uh, in the case of Love Island, um, I started by thinking about my experience watching the show and 
thinking about like the kinds of things that people had to say about it on social media and these kinds of things. Uh, and this is just an excerpt from an early design document that we produced. It's not, um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but like the important things are that the brain of Love Island, I think, is in the kind of the romantic intrigues and the kind of scheming of the contestants and the kind of strategy game of how am I going to find love. The heart of the show, on the other hand, is in its kind of champagne and roses kind of construction of love and sex and relationships. And also the kind of the yang to that is the kind of uh, the sort of arguments and the drama that emerge from that. And then like thirdly, the kind of soul of the show is in this kind of warm, positive, friendly tone that it's all wrapped up in, which I think um, serves as a kind of a fertile ground for these moments of like real humanity. Um, the benefit of this way of defining the show, um, this metaphor of brain or heart and soul, you can give or take, but like, um, is that it tells us what people enjoy thinking and talk about when they're interacting with the IP, uh, where its emotional impact comes from, what kind of tone it ought to be striking in any given moment. Um, and I'd encourage you to think about this uh, in your projects. What is the emotional tone of the kind of moment to moment of my storyline? Uh, what, by contrast, are like the highly charged emotional moments that are the moments that are going to stick in people's minds, you know? And, uh, and thirdly, what's the kind of mechanism by which your format or your game raises one into the other? Um, if you get those things right, and if they reflect the expectations that the audience are bringing from their experience with the IP, then you can be confident that your IP's, your, your adaptation is basically going to ring true. You know, it's going to kind of sound, sound right. It's going to feel like it really is the thing it pretends to be, you know? Um, and this allows you to answer, like, design questions. Uh, you can use these kinds of parameters to, like, uh, inform the design of more specific things like plot arcs and characters and this kind of thing. Um, I'd encourage you to apply this kind of analysis to any kind of an IP that you're working on, even if it's like your own proprietary IP, uh, to see if it gives some focus to questions about your kind of narrative and your gameplay. Um, so, uh, building on that, um, I'm going to give you two quick case studies of how we design some characters in the game. Uh, the first uh, thing is that Love Island is like, it's a funny show and a lot of it's about kind of general sort of chat and people spend their time, if you turn it on, watch a random slice from the middle of any episode, probably what you're going to see is people sitting around on sun lounges having a conversation and it'll be edited in such a way that someone says something funny and that's what you see. So we designed this guy called Tim. Um, the basic sort of reason that Tim exists is to just kind of like make jokes and to be the butt of other people's jokes. Um, and we wanted to make sure that he'd have this function kind of continuously all the way through the game. We didn't want to complicate it by having him like maybe be your ex. Like there's nothing worse than like hearing your ex crack like funny jokes all day long. So we decided that you wouldn't be able to romance him and he'd instead have a kind of like a friendly relationship with the player character. But yes, he's uh, not romanceable. That keeps his comic role straightforward. And um, by having a clear sense that this was his function, we were able to produce a character who was both kind of faithful to the spirit of the show, but also like kind of a fun person for players to interact with and to kind of get to know. Um, as a conflicting example, this is Allegra. Um, so I said that like the uh, the sort of the, the the soul of the game is in its humor, but what's often memorable about Love Island is the moments where it kind of flares up into arguments. And so we wanted a character who could kind of exist to sort of provoke controversy or to kind of um, get into uh, acrimonious kind of relationships with the player character. Um, and so her function is basically to call you out for making advances on her partner or to, uh, or to kind of challenge the decisions that you seem to have made. Um, you have a big argument with her quite early on in the game. Um, and I actually think that in the final implementation, we got her a bit wrong. We kind of went over the top with this combative aspect of her character. Um, but this kind of had a happy side, that, like she seems incredibly extra, she's like very like over the top as a person. Um, and because this whole thing was generally kind of on brand, uh, it kind of felt like a feature rather than a bug, you know. Um, she's probably one of the most talked about characters in the game in the final version. And I expect anybody that is in the audience that is a writer is kind of shaking their head at this idea that you should kind of build characters around narrow functional conceptions rather than kind of uh, things like, um, you know, deep personalities and nuanced storylines and this kind of thing. But I actually think that like our first objective here is to make something that captures the feeling of the license that you're working on. That's the most kind of important part of this whole design process. Um, and so by building characters around functions in this way, it lets you kind of capitalize on what's appealing about the IP while still leaving yourself room to have like a fun time working on it. Tim and Allegra are maybe kind of built around narrow conceptions of functions that I've derived from an analysis of an IP, but they're also at the center of some of the best moments in the game. Their characters aren't compromised by the fact that they're designed explicitly for these narrow functions. They're actually kind of uh, like energized by it. It gives them lots of room to breathe. It makes them really interesting people to kind of get to know. Um, 
so that's the sort of first half of what I've got to say. Um, the rest of this talk is going to be about kind of how we did it. Um, the thing about working with an IP is that it's, uh, it's something going to put timers on your project that you can't predict. And so there's stuff that you can do in your kind of planning and your um, kind of conceptualization of your project that is going to make this bearable. Um, Love Island, the game, uh, season one. Uh, the final script was about 300,000 words, which is about 60% of the length of Infinite Jest, or like if you took 10 copies of Animal Farm and stacked them end on end. Um, and it was written by me and one other writer, and we did most of that in around six months. It was a huge amount of content. And more importantly, we did have this incredibly heavy deadline that we knew we couldn't miss. The show was going to be going on air on the first Monday of June 2018, and if the game wasn't ready, the show was going to go without it. You know, There was no delaying it. Um, and for this reason, it was really important that we designed the game in such a way that we were able to kind of de-scope it if the need be. Um, this was definitely a kind of a consideration that saved our butts. Um, and also that we were able to get the content approved by our stakeholders in a kind of a speedy, timely kind of a way. So um, firstly, on this uh, issue of kind of scope management, um, you've got to plan smartly and you've got to keep careful track of the scope of your game. It sounds trivial, but especially in the case of like interactive narratives, like what we're dealing with, it's something that you need to plan quite carefully. Um, here's a quote from Charlie Brooker about Bandersnatch. He said, by, oh, I took out the F word a bunch of times. He said, by the end, it got so complex that we had to bring in coders to support the creative process to be able to interpret what we were trying to do. And I just think you can't let your work get that complex. It's a nightmare if that's what you're dealing with. Um, you need to design with this kind of hazard of complexity in mind, and you need to work around it. Obviously, the whole point of writing a choice-based narrative is that choices have consequences, and consequences uh, kind of are respected later on in the story, and this can make for a complicated thing with all these different permutations. But, but um, you have to accept that this complexity is kind of inevitable, and you have to uh, find ways to kind of mediate with it. Um, if your project has become so complex that you lose a clear of what's clear of what's going on, it's going to make writing and editing painful and going to make them slow. And we knew that hitting this immovable TV deadline would almost inevitably mean cutting sections of work in order to fit with our asset production pipelines and our release schedule. And that having the plot outlined very clearly in a high level of detail with all supporting documents um, was basically how we did it. Um, maintaining clarity on your project is essential because you're probably going to have to cut stuff unless everything in your project goes perfectly according to plan. And if you've ever done that, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, but you've, um, you, know, you need to be able to cut kind of decisively and with confidence. The way that we did this was we kept like a careful record of all the possible states of the game. We had detailed episode outlines for every episode that focused on the key choices that players could make and the way that choices from earlier episodes would sort of uh, would impact uh, future episodes. Um, having the kind of statefulness of the game clearly articulated in this way let us write very efficiently, but it also let us cut and edit with a lot of confidence without the fear that a cut in one place would lead to the plot unraveling somewhere else down the line. And I really can't overstate the extent to which this strategy saved the project towards the end. We had to cut around 15 episodes worth of content when we realized that we'd never be able to write and get it approved kind of in time. But designing around this idea that content might need to be cut kind of enabled us to get the game released on schedule. Um, and then the last thing that I want to kind of get into is dealing with stakeholders. If you're working with a licensed IP, there are probably going to be some people that represent the owners of the IP who are going to be uh, like dealing with your script, who are going to be kind of approving them and uh, like uh, giving you feedback and making sure that you're making something that's acceptable from the point of view of the owners of the brand. Um, if your IP comes from film and cinema or even from a different corner of the games industry, your stakeholders might not immediately understand what you're working on. Games are by their nature, hard to understand until you have them in front of you. And the nature of development is often such that playable code doesn't materialize until considerable work has already been sunk into content development. And this can lead to a massive pitfall that we fell into. Um, I will describe how it happened. Um, stage one, our stakeholders were approving scripts um, as we wrote them, but they didn't get to actually play the game until quite a lot of time had been spent uh, kind of getting the scripts, uh, until quite a lot of scripts had already been signed off. Um, Secondly, once they actually got to play the game, their understanding of what they were dealing with was transformed by that, and this altered the criteria that they were using to judge the scripts. And then thirdly, the actual pitfall was that entirely reasonably, um, at quite a late stage in the project, they no longer felt comfortable with their whole initial bracket of sign-offs, and they had to go back over a large amount of work and request a considerable number of changes right at the last minute, which was a nightmare. Um, now, late stage changes are probably inevitable to a certain extent when getting involved with, uh, with, with stakeholders and such, but I think that we could have done a much better job of helping them to understand the game from an earlier stage, perhaps by showing them similar games or by spending time talking to them about it, or even um, 
just by kind of phoning them up and like explaining it. I don't know. Um, the problem with any kind of like client relationship management is that they're probably not going to have a lot of time for you. And they're also not going to have much familiarity with games potentially at all. But I nevertheless feel like a kind of a relatively small amount of time spent uh, on this early on in the project could have uh, saved a considerably large amount of work at a later time. Um, anyway, to conclude, um, on a slightly different note, um, at Fusebox, our sort of um, reason to be is to try and find a way to get this kind of thing, you know, choice-based narratives, branching dialogue, all that good stuff, um, in front of a popular mainstream audience. Um, it seems to me that there's so much smart design that's been honed for decades in this walled garden of interactive fiction, but it's never found a way in front of a kind of a genuinely mainstream audience. Um, there's no reason why interactive storytelling needs to be relegated to this niche. And I think that partnerships with popular IP are a really good way to expand into undiscovered markets. I also think that the days when IP times were kind of lazy, low rent affairs are in the past. Audience standards are going up. People have been talking about that this afternoon to a certain extent. Um, and I feel like what we're doing here is we're laying some groundwork for something that's going to become a far more significant part of the cultural landscape in future years. Um, anyway, that's that. Thanks very much. Um, any questions? Oh, do we have time for questions? Cool. No? Cool. All right. Well, that's my Twitter. Thanks very much. <laughs>